Hey there, Mikhaus here with Toasty DIY, and today I'm going to be talking about something that I normally don't talk about, which is Pathfinder. And I want to explain my experience as somebody who played Pathfinder for the first time after playing D&D for six years. So let's get started by looking at what I got, which is the beginner box set from Books A Million. I went over there, and it was 40 bucks to buy the box set. And the way I look at this is the D&D box set, I think, is around 40 as well. But the D&D books themselves, there's three of them for the core rules, the Monster Manual, the Player's Guide, and the DM's Guide. Uh, and that's 40 bucks a piece. So you're talking about 40, 80, 120, just start playing D&D. Uh, we've almost built computers for that price here. So realize that's a, that's a good chunk of change if you want to play the game. Meanwhile, the DM's Guide for Pathfinder was just 60 bucks for one book. That's it. That's the price of buying a new AAA title nowadays. It's actually almost cheaper than things have gone up. So with that being said, you get these two books, a set of dice, uh, a lot of punch outs and standees, and then these character sheets. So for those of you who played D&D, I want to kind of explain some things that are cool and then we'll get into why. So I'll kind of explain my top like four or five things that were interesting playing Pathfinder over D&D and then I'll get more in depth after. So number one was critical success is different in Pathfinder. Let's say you have a character, a, a knight who happens to get a, a thing of lockpicks, right? And they end up at a great vault. This vault is probably like a 35 to open because it's insanely tough. It's the vault for a bank and this knight has never opened the door before uh you know lockpick before well in DD they could try these tools and just get an at 20 right you might say well it, they get the best possible options well let's just say this is a magically enchanted door so they go to try it and they roll a natural 20. so in pathfinder we look at it and say their thievery skill is plus zero so they rolled the nat 20 and so that means they move up one level of success and the chart goes critical failure failure success critical success Critical failure means the alarm goes off, you know, it cracks and people find out they're there. Well, because you're old at 20, he moves to just failure in which the lockpick breaks, but the alarm doesn't sound. You found out there's an alarm. Lucky you. He doesn't automatically succeed. So I like this kind of range because it also applies to attacking. If your enemy has 12 AC and you roll a 22 or sorry, you know, a 19, but it's plus six then you've gotten the ability to hit this monster and crit. So they have special crit effects like the Warhammer. When you get a crit, the deadly effect is times the damage by three, which is awesome. For the Rapier, it's add another D8 if you crit. And when you're attacking goblins and you're flanking them and getting a flat-footed bonus, which I'll get into, it's very cool that you can advantage your odds of getting a crit. Very fun. Number two is that flanking is built into the rules. I found that pretty fun for the fact that the... Uh, creatures had higher ACs than I was used to, but I realized, oh, it's because you're supposed to be playing with your team and working together to try to get around these enemies and get into advantageous spots to hit them. So you can get behind someone, making them take the condition flat-footed, which means they get a minus two to their AC is the easiest way to explain it. And that way you're able to hit them more consistently so your rogue's getting sneak attack damage because they're flat-footed, which is really fun. Number three is that as a level one character, you're more equivalent to a level three character in D&D, so you kind of miss out on that survival horror early game, but you immediately get to start having fun with the idea that you can attack three times as a level one character. And I did not find that that experience bogged down how long the game plays because it's a pretty simple system. The first attack you do is no minuses, just a flat attack. So if you have a plus seven to hit, you roll, plus seven, you hit or don't hit, right? Then let's say you want to attack again. You have three actions. So you just one action to attack. I'm going to go ahead and attack again. All right, so now I've got one action left. So what, when I do my second attack, I take a minus five because I'm, you know, they're trying to make it less advantageous to just attack, attack, attack. I take a minus five. I take that from my plus seven, it's now plus two. I roll, I hit again, awesome. I just dealt damage twice in one turn as a level one. And then let's just say, I'm gonna go ahead and attack a third time. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a third attack because instead of moving, I use that action to attack again. So now I've attacked three times because I have my bow and I just went one, two, three. But this third bow shot is minus 10. There is a way to make this easier on yourself with what's called like agility modifier. So if you have a weapon that has agility, on it or agile, then it means that you get a minus four and a minus eight instead of, you know, minus 10 and minus five. So you're improving your odds of hitting. And I think later in the game, you're going to have much higher bonuses to weapon attacks. Uh, in this level one adventure that they take you through in the book, they give you a plus one long sword in that adventure, uh, or it might be a short sword. So like, it's clear that magic items are pretty common in this world. 
at least with how rules is written are. The next thing I thought was really cool is that dex is not a god stat like it is in D&D. Like, a lot of things rely on dex. Like, I personally found it that there's almost no reason in D&D 5e to use any weapon that doesn't allow you to use the dex modifier for the sake of efficiency. You go earlier in the turn because your dex is high. You deal more damage because your dex is high. Your dexterity saving throws, which is like every trap ever, is high. There's really no reason not to take high dex. Like, if I take high strength, I hardly ever make strength saving throws unless my dungeon master is really focused on making sure I'm going through a diversity of roles. This game is kind of built it in where when a trap goes off, I attack, I do an attack roll, not a dex save. It's not about you avoiding it. It's about how do you take it. And your armor class also includes how nimble you are, depending on how you, you know, whether you're using unarmored or what. Uh, so when you have a warrior with an AC of 18 and the, you know, falling ceiling comes down, it's kind of assumed they raise their shield and it blocks while the wizard just gets smacked. It's clear that the party order is going to matter. You don't get dex for your initiative modifier. It's your perception. It's how quickly do you recognize a fight's happening, not how quickly do you react to it. It's seeing it happening is more important. So your perception changes your initiative unless you're sneaking in. In that case, you can take your stealth modifier which is pretty cool for the rogue. I know they could do that. And I just appreciate that dex was not the most important stat, but it definitely was effective. If you had your dex high, you could shoot range, which is nice. You could be better with your agile weapons, which is nice. So interesting to see. I like this idea that, you know, there's no stat that's the one and done because constitution is not a dump stat anymore. So when it comes to constitution and long resting, I always found it's kind of awkward when your heroes are traveling through a dungeon and then they sit down for eight hours and they go from being like at one hit point out of 103. So like or 100 hit points, you think they're at one percent health and they're bleeding, they're sweating, they're tired. And eight hours restores all of that without magic. Seems kind of weird to me. But in Pathfinder, your rest per day after your, your long rest of I think it's around eight or ten hours. Uh, forgive me, I'm loosening some of the rules, you regain your level times your constitution modifier. So if you are traveling through a dungeon and you have 26 health and you go down to one health and you have a plus one constitution modifier, if you have no healer and no healing items, it should take you 25 days to get back your hit points. So a whole month to heal back, which I don't know if any of you are, are, are you know, starting to reach the age where if you help someone move, you feel it for the next week, or you roll your ankle playing pickleball and it's still hurting in the office. It, it takes a while to get over injury, and I think it's cool because then your healer can just say, okay, well, let's stay the night. I'll heal us in the morning, but I'll need another day to get those back, or we can risk going in with no heals. Up to you all. Because healing is very important. When you go to the healers, this is the character sheet. You'll see that the healing spell right here, heal, very simply, oh, very simply listed, is... Uh, if the target is a willing living creature, they heal 1d8. If they're undead, they take 1d8 positive damage. So I like healing can be a damage spell, but get a basic fortitude save. The number of actions you take changes the spell. So remember I said you have three actions. If you spend all three actions to heal, then it becomes affects all living and undead creatures in 30 feet. So it becomes an AOE. So you may take your first turn to move into position, raise your shield on the next turn, blast. You do a giant heal, healing all of your allies and damaging the undead. Uh, if you do just two you can modify the spell to affect all creatures within 30 feet. And I just love this idea that it's not just firebolt every time. If you attribute more, you can, like, more actions, more of your time into the spell, you can create different effects. I think that's super cool. Um, and you've got different things, like the ability to raise your shield. If you raise your shield, then you get a plus two to your AC. You don't get that plus two unless you raise it. But by raising it, you now get a reaction where you can, like, brace for impact. What's it called? Shield block. If your shield is raised, you spend a reaction to block physical attack, reducing the damage by five, but then you and your shield both take any damage left over. This might break or destroy your shield. Your shield has a maximum of 20 hit points. So pretty cool. I think that's really, really awesome, especially for low-level characters. It allows you to tank. I had a player march into a room with four skeletons, and as a level one adventurer, four skeletons, and a zombie is deadly for one person to tank alone especially without some magic items. But she went in there and took two attacks from each of them because every skeleton got attacked twice. They all have three actions as well. They walk up, one action, attack, attack. Now this one has a minus five, and they only get a plus six. And she has an, a 20 armor class at this point because she's raised her shield. So the odds they're going to hit over a 20 
very low. So it makes this tanking mechanic feel very real. It makes the healing mechanic feel very real. Uh, the other two classes that give you in the thing are the wizard, the rogue, and then you saw fighter and cleric. So this kind of devolved into me just giving my basic opinions of things I think are interesting about Pathfinder. But I just have to say that I think it's it's pretty interesting when you build a character. There's different rules. One other going into it is it a lot more than D and D. Yes, but I really respect the fact that when they give you these rules, they do the best to make this as inviting as possible for a new player. If you buy the beginner set of dice or the beginner set for D and D five E, you get a set of polyhedral dice. But on here, and like you get character sheets, but on here they've labeled everything because they understand they're more confusing and they want to make it as easy as possible. So when you're going through and asking questions, it literally has labeled the boxes for you, almost like a tax form, which is not the most exciting thing to say. But if you're like, you know, it says if you take damage, it comes from box E. And then you look around for, oh, okay, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, E. The set of dice they give you in the box are color coordinated to this because a lot of people have trouble between D8 and D12 and D10. They've never seen these dice before. Everyone's kind of seen the D20 through whatever got them interested in this. And then you've got your D4. Uh, though I hate their D4 is which one lays flat, not the which one's at the top. I don't know why that irks me so badly. But you've got all your different things here, your different traits, your weapons, all labeled with this nice little yellow. Uh, it has the action thing here as well as they give you a little card that tells you what actions you can take. And it shows you how many it costs. And they give you a little cardboard cutouts to move off so you can track your actions if this is your first time over here like i said on the back side they have the explanation of all the different things why they're on your character sheet where they came from what's in your inventory on a basic level how attack opportunity works here's your actions that are unique to you because you're uh you know a warrior so why is that on your character sheet i like the difference in what these weapons can have so if you look right here using the long sword has the burst tile uh, as the trait, we have traits for the dagger being agile, finesse, thrown, 10 feet, versatile. We have deadly D10 for the short bow. So if you crit, those are the things that kick in when it says deadly. I really just appreciate some of the things they have. And I think it's, it's rather easily explained when you have different things. So like, yeah, there's perception. We've got it with the nice little magnifying glass, make it easy. There's the shield to make sure it's easy to know this is your defense. It tells you what you're trained at. Instead of having one box down here, that's all the things you're good at. You can go look in specific boxes for these things, seeing that, oh, here's my saving throws. I'm trained. I'm also an expert. Uh, I'm trained expert. Because I, I have not fully gotten to the trained expert thing, but I like to know. It's, it's a lot easier to see if I can just pick up a short sword and swing it because I've never really pinged my players on not being proficient at short swords and other things. Cause I never knew which all the martial weapons was. And it wasn't easy for me to just ask them, Oh, Hey wizard, you're just grabbing a sword. Right. And they say, yeah, I say, Oh, are you trained in simple, we simple weapons? I never felt like a convenient thing because I know as players, it wasn't as easy as ticking a box. They had to write it down. And it was like, you're, pr you're trained at simple weapons, short swords and spears because of your class and it's like well it's like it was easy and then you added very unique modifiers instead of being a blanket easier simpler martial or not at all another very interesting thing that's on here is this right here the lore category uh in pathfinder you can have lore essentially a skill check that only you know things about so for like instance for the fighter who was a mercenary but formerly a farmer they have farming as their lore so if any questions come up about farming or about gods of farming maybe they know uh, for the cleric, I believe it was religion. Or no, not religion. What was the cleric's? The cleric has scribing, which is a unique thing to be, you know, taught in. But the uh, the rogue was like the underworld. And then the, who was it? The last one was like academia, the wizard. So overall, I really enjoyed my experience. I would say combat was more fun in Pathfinder than it's ever been in 5e. Uh, as much as I add things, the only problem was in the box set, they take the idea, they're teaching the mechanics. They're not giving you a story. The story is very simple. It starts with you arrive in town and have already accepted the quest. There's no hook to pull you in. It's assuming that you're there to fight monsters, not there to role play. Because there was only one puzzle in there, and it didn't fit the room at all. It was just there. There was no lore of why this dungeon exists, which I feel like D&D always preps you with. The dungeon didn't feel cohesive. It felt like scrambled together. But that might be the more Pathfinder world where there's less questions, more battles. That's totally acceptable. 
you know, I don't play every game looking for lore. When I'm playing a rhythm game, I just want to listen to music and I want to play my game. When I'm playing Skyrim, I want my lore. When I'm playing Witcher 3, I want my lore, and then I want my good combat. You, you want different things from different games, and this one's definitely more focused on combat. But I would suggest that if you're a D&D 5e player and you are comfortable with D&D 5e, you've been playing it for a while, you're getting to the point where you're homebrewing a lot, then might I suggest picking up the Pathfinder basic rule kit, bring over some friends, have them pick the pre-made characters, and it's a pretty fun time to see the differences because you can form your opinion, like or don't like. Uh, there's a lot more math over here, and I'm, I'm worried about what high levels would look like when it gets to that. But it's just, it's just cool. I really enjoy the fact they gave you like 20 standees. Like you have tons of little standees. They give you, I think, 10 actual holders for it. And then like over 150 different little standees of like the cardboard flat ones. So you could just start running an adventure. And I'm, I'm pretty confident from what they gave me, I could run a level one to two adventure uh, with just what I have. And when I'm ready to move on, I can go buy the DM's book for 60 bucks and that's everything. And it's indexed on the side. So you can just like lift it up and see on the side of the page where you are. Uh, you don't have to open the page fully. It's it's It knows it's one large book. And so they print it in a way that you can quickly index it. So is it more complicated? Yes. Does that lead to some more interesting mechanics? I think so. So I give Pathfinder, you know, a thumbs up. I'm actually pretty excited. I'm going to have my my friend group go through and maybe play a day. And maybe if we like it enough, I and in the future, we might run our next campaign as that. I don't think we would switch over mid, mid thing. But uh, it was pretty exciting. So thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. This has been my experience as somebody who loves D&D. Try not Pathfinder for the first time. So like I said, any questions, leave them down below. I'll try to answer them. I'm, I definitely by no means uh, fully understand Pathfinder mechanics, but I've glimpsed into the world and I have liked what I've seen. So thanks for coming.